underrated. The Steph Curry documentary has been out about two weeks. And I wanted to give my thoughts on it, but I also wanted to give you all a chance to catch it. Apple TV. So uh, if you haven't watched it already, I obviously highly recommend it. And this first part of this podcast, you know, you can go ahead and skip through. I'll give you a timestamp if you're uh, waiting to watch it or haven't caught it yet. But I wanted to give my thoughts on it. Bear with me. I've got notes. I don't have it like off the top of the dome. I guess the first thing that I wanted to start with was Apple TV and their cameras, their Dolby Vision, their color, their cinematography is just a notch above all the other streaming services. So it was dope that it was on Apple TV, right? And it starts off with him in Madison Square Garden setting that NBA three-point record and the emotions behind that. Uh, I loved the celebration. I, I admit, I remember leading into it, I was a little nervous that he was going to do some sort of goofy celebration, right? Because Steph, you know, he's, remember when he did the Beyonce, the uh-oh, uh-oh, uh, I guarantee that was from his kids, right? You get it. When you're a dad and when you're a girl dad, um, sometimes you're going to get caught doing some funny things just because that's the influence in your life. But I loved just the raw emotion when he set that record and just, there was no dancing and it was just raw emotion. Um, but what caught my eye was he's in New York celebrating that night. You notice Steph likes to drink a little. Whenever the event calls for it, Steph's got a drink in his hand. You know he's got the gentleman's whiskey. I'm not a whiskey guy myself, but all these guys seem to have a liquor now. But anyway, he's in the bar. He's celebrating. And Kevin Durant pulls up. KD pulls up. Just says, what's up? Daps him up. He doesn't like hang out or anything, but pulls up and says, hey, I just wanted to congratulate you and show you love. Um, and I was shocked to see that. And what was the quote? Steph said, quote, most misunderstood, m most misunderstood dude in the freaking league right now. Steph, I guess he doesn't curse in the freaking league right now. Or he's just aware of the cameras. He's very aware of the cameras. Right. But it, it just it, there was a lot of real love between them. It, just the tone that Steph used in his voice. It was just genuine. And it was a cool moment. And it got me to thinking, you know, like in an alternate universe, had had Steph been in the Russ situation, like right, they they were they were drafted together on the same team and they were an original duo. I think it, it could have went a long time, right? You don't want to say forever, not in this era, especially we know who KD is, right? And, but I think that you know Dre obviously and Clay altered Steph and Katie's dynamic and relationship had it been a Tatum Jalen Brown situation a Katie Russ situation where it was just one two and then they built around them right and it could have never been that but I just it made me think what would have that looked like because it seems like there was a real admiration admiration and love between the two that I wasn't sure was there honestly I I, I didn't know that um, but thinking about duos, what duo has stayed together, like all like Hall of Fame duos stay together their entire career outside of Stockton and Malone? It just doesn't happen, right? But that was the first thing that caught my eye. And then it moved into the story was really Davidson. The other thing that I loved about it was it was pure basketball. It was pure basketball, right? They didn't do like really the family dynamic or his other hobbies or anything, right? They showed Seth like one time, right? They kept his little ugly ass in a cellar. They didn't show Seth or Sidel. <laughs> um, but what stuck out to me was he didn't change his jumper till his sophomore year in high school, right? And Dell said, well, this is what you got to do. Uh, you, you know, he's shooting it from his waist. It's too low. A lot of kids still do that. It, the irony is so many kids have funky shots now because they're trying to shoot deep threes like Steph. But it wasn't until his sophomore year who, where uh, they said, 15 years old, he still hadn't hit puberty, but I just thought that was a little late, especially when your dad is one of the best shooters in the NBA, right? You would have imagined Dell at nine or 10 would have been like, Hey, Steph, you, you can't have two hands on the ball at all time. You can't gunsling it from your hip, but there are two different approaches when you look at like parenting a kid in sport or just the, the pathway up, right? And it's, do you sandbag your kid? and let him play against lesser competition and just let him do his thing and build their confidence to a 10? Or do they play up and kind of have a reality check and force them to grow early on, right? And I, I, I don't think it's a right answer universally. I think that it depends on the kid and it depends on the talent. Certainly Steph not hitting puberty till he was 16. They, they were, it seemed like Dell and Sonia, that their approach was more of, 
let's just let him build his confidence, right? Let's not let him, you know, and, but I thought that that was a little bit late, but really the big picture, Bob McKillop, McKillop, is that how you say the Davidson's coach name? He He's now retired and his son has taken over there. Um, clearly it, it, he looks like he's had the biggest impact on Steph's career. He, it, he, he really did. And, you know, uh, if Steph had gone, you know, Seth went to Duke, obviously off Steph's name, but if Steph had gotten offers to a Duke, a North Carolina, a Kentucky, the, what are the chances he just gets buried, right? And, and he never becomes Steph. You, again, that fine line of playing up or building your confidence is small, big fish in a small pond type of situation at Davidson, right? Where they kind of handed him the keys and let him figure it out. I, I, I thought that that's a, a big part of how he's learned to deal with struggle and leadership is through Bob McKillop in, in that Davidson experience. Uh, one quote that he had was, it was after a practice, he said, you played as if it was a gift today. You played as if it was a gift today. And I think that that, that was one of the greatest coaching lines I've ever heard. If you can take that approach if you know, to the day-to-day -day grind, and then he said, of course you played with confidence. Of course you played well. Of course you played with flow. Why? Because it was a gift today. No one was taking it for granted, right? And he dropped a, a lot of jewels like that. And then he talked about scouting him locally in North Carolina, right? And the emotional toughness was the term he used for Steph. And I, another, again, another gem of a quote. And I think that that is a term that we've got to dial into and use when you look at talent across all sports and athletes and draft combines, you know, we just got done with the draft and evaluating young guys. What's their emotional toughness? And the way he described it was right. Like no matter what Steph did, how he was shooting or how he was playing, he just kept playing. He just kept playing. He'd miss. What was it? Uh, they, they had a reporter for, for Davidson. You know, he goes, the dude, the kid, the freshman comes out, he airballs a three in the first 10 seconds, comes down and pumps another three. Right now, you could call it, sometimes you say irrational confidence in a player, but it, 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 sometimes it's it's emotional toughness, right? Because Steph, we all know Steph's not irrationally confident, right? We, we've seen him struggle, but he perseveres and he pushes through. And for McKillop and the Davidson staff to recognize that when he was 15 and 16 years old, you never hear about anybody talking about that. But I guess a lot of the time when you're dealing with a Zion or a LeBron or one of these guys, they're so talented their emotional toughness isn't tested at that age, right? And so it was rare to see who Steph is now, but him get tested all the way up like that. A lot of the time, these guys don't hit that wall till the NBA level, but I think it's something that if I was a scout right now or, or you know, in, in, that, in that world, I would try to test that at a younger age, at high school level, at the college level, even if it's not being tested on a daily basis, figure out a way to test it. Because I think that's one of, uh, Steph's, I wouldn't say hidden superpowers, but uh, subtle superpowers, right? So then he has 13 turnovers in his debut, right? That's always been a part of his game, right? The the uh, the risk reward of a pass, the flow, the looseness, that's always going to be a part of his game. 13 turnovers, a miserable debut, right? And then in the second game, he comes out and he misses more. He misses more. And then finally he gets going. Finally, he gets going, right? And again, that emotional toughness. Now, I do think, I do think a part of, part of it is just his wiring, right? And his nature. But I think there is an element of like, hey, my dad is Del Curry, like one of the best shooters in NBA history. I can do this. I think it gave him another level of belief that maybe, a, 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 I will say a normal kid, but a kid without that pedigree, he may have held his head and been like, I can't do this. I can't do this. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm, Dell's my dad. Like, I know I can push through and do this. And so then in that second game, he gets going. And then it was just kind of a snowball effect from there at, at, at Davidson where you saw there was a lot of like white, smaller white players on that team. They had a big Nigerian kid. But again, if he's at a at a bigger program, He's never afforded that luxury to break through those struggles and take those shots. And so it goes back and forth between the 21-22 tw championship season and his run at Davidson, right? And he, you know, even as a freshman, once he got going, the keys were his. Now they, they'd made it to the tournament, but they kept coming up short. 
And so in his final junior season, they load up the strength of schedule. They're playing Kentucky. They're playing Stanford. They're they're playing all the you know. And strength of schedule is is a, it's kind of like the the sandbag or play up type of thing when you're building your kids' confidence, your athletes' confidence. It's a it's a delicate task, right? It like it's too, you play too weak a, a strength of schedule and you're overconfident. You're not being tested enough. It's too tough. The team gets broken down and loses their confidence, right? Like my daughter's team. Their coach's philosophy is where they play all the top schools from from basically the West Coast in the summer and all these different leagues. So and when we get to our region league and our, you know, the, the school year, it's easier. But they get beat down. They get beat down. It's a fine line because their rival kind of does it the other way. They'll play down a little bit, win these offseason tournaments and championships. And so, again, it, I, it's not a right or wrong way. I think you have to know with know the personality and character of your team to do it, but they, they load their strength of schedule and they're getting beat down, but then ultimately they run off 20 in a row, right? It worked. The, the emotional toughness of Steph leading that team, it worked. They win 20 in a row. And then most of you know that tournament run that he went on, right? Where they knocked off a, a bunch of powers and made it all the way to the elite eight. Did you see in the Elite Eight, he was wearing the LeBron ones? Did you catch that? That was kind of wild to see. And then it came down to a final shot, one that he didn't take. One that he didn't take. And, and, the, and the reality is, like, you, you always hear the saying, like, hey, I'd ru- I, you got to go down with your star taking the shot. But sometimes, especially in that scenario where, you know, he's going to see two no matter what, you got to make the pass. He, he, it was the right play. It didn't drop. Um but that was that the storied end to that. What else? I didn't know. I mean, I guess I could have done the math, right? I it's silly me, but like Sonia had Steph when she was in college. And to me, I think that the bond between Steph and Sonia that makes it stronger than the other two. Obviously, I'm just speaking out my ass here, but just from what I know from from parenthood and and and, and relationships. Her firstborn son at that age it is is they I, I'm willing to guess they have a unique special bond. Um, but yeah, man, it just it's just inspiring. Obviously, you got to go watch it for yourself. It just it just makes you want to go hoop. It just makes you want to go hoop, right? And you know, Steph t- to me, Steph is he is your boy that's always the voice of reason. Right. We all have that guy in in the click that's like the voice of reason and just naturally does the right thing. Like we all I'd like to think most of us, we all do the right thing when you know you got to. You're like, ah, yeah, you're right. Like Steph naturally does it, you know, and he's just that guy. And so, you know, you always hear you always hear the saying with parents, we got lucky. Right. You're like, oh, Steph's such a great kid. We got lucky. And it is true to an extent. But I think you also have to give credit to both Dell and Sonia um, for who they've raised, man. Just super inspirational.